Hi everyone. Let's do something different today, something new today. Do you read journals? I think it is a very important part of learning. In medicine, we have to expertise the skills which we have been doing or which we have learned from our seniors or from our colleagues. But I think it is equally important to keep yourself updated with the knowledge what is going on around in the world. It keeps you fresh, it keeps you motivated, it keeps you open to new ideas and new treatments and new research what is happening in the concern field. For a long time, I was thinking to do this exercise of reading articles in journals with you all. Why? Because you will agree with me, reading articles, looking at the figures, the statistical analysis, and trying to interpret those is a bit boring most of the times. So if you have some company, it is easy to do things. I keep on reading articles, but you know what is my problem? When I read articles, other than when I have to prepare a lecture or I have to do some specific work, I just read the abstract. And more specifically, I jump to the conclusion and then start drawing conclusions of my own from that. And that is the end of story. But that's not the right way to do it. For my learning mostly and to teach you this habit, this convention of reading latest information from articles, I am starting the series on reading journals. So... First, I want, if you have not done this exercise before and you are wondering which journal to pick up and if your interest is urogynecology, I suggest you to start with the blue journal, the International Urogynecology Journal because all other journals which have the articles related to pelvic floor disorders, most of them have overlaps with urology and many of them have overlaps with obstetrics and gynecology. This is one good journal which is solely dedicated to all articles which have information related to urogynecology and urogynecology only. So today we are going to do the same thing. I have picked up this May issue of 2022 to discuss a very interesting article. Actually it is related to what we are doing here. Let me walk you through this article. So this is International Urogynecology Journal, the official journal of Ayuga. And we have picked up the May issue of the same, that is the most recent one. Though in this issue, there are a lot of articles which caught my attention. I paused in this one. You will understand because of the topic here. The title is Evaluation of YouTube Videos on Primary Bladder Pain Syndrome and it is an original article. Let's first go through the abstract. Reading abstract always helps because it gives you an idea whether it is worth going through the entire article or actually the title looked good but it doesn't suit your interest. So here, according to the abstract, they say the background of doing this study was the idea that seeking health information, as all of us know, that is increasing over the years. And this article was aimed or this study was aimed to evaluate the role of videos which were published in YouTube in relation to primary bladder pain syndrome also known as bladder pain syndrome or painful bladder or interstitial cystitis, which is indeed a common problem. This is the first time when I came across such study where YouTube videos were evaluated in a scientific background. What I realized that the study was done exactly the way we do systematic reviews of literature from various sources like PubMed, etc. So what they did, they tried to find out 
the videos which were picked up by the keywords or search terminologies and finally they found around 300 videos in YouTube related to painful bladder syndrome or bladder pain syndrome or interstitial cystitis. Finally, after evaluating them from the content, they could get around 62 videos which they found had reliable information. And then what they did, they tried to analyze the content in this. And very interesting finding which they have mentioned in abstract also is that the number of views, likes, dislikes and comments were lower in those videos which were by professors, by non-profit organization and universities which were actually more reliable ones. And they concluded that although about half of the videos were reliable, most were long and were related to medical lectures and it was difficult by a patient or a non-professional person to interpret it. So, the abstract looks quite interesting, isn't it? Let's delve into the details of the entire paper. Primary bladder pain syndrome, which is the standard recent terminology, is defined as the occurrence of persistent or recurrent pain perceived in the urinary bladder region with at least one other symptom, for example, pain while filling the bladder or urgency, frequency or nocturia. Various names, as we have discussed before, which are used for primary bladder pain syndrome. Very commonly, it is known as or the old name is interstitial cystitis, which is still very common. The other name is painful bladder syndrome or bladder pain syndrome but the terminology which we must use now please all of you remember is primary BPS which is primary bladder pain syndrome we all know that it is much more common in women as compared to men and it is gradually increasing the incidence has been gradually increasing over the past few years if you compare the female-male ratio, it is 10 times more common in women as compared to men. In the background, the authors mentioned that the internet is primary source, which various studies have revealed that to seek healthcare information, it is used very frequently. If you see US, the data says that 74% of adults use internet to seek healthcare information. And YouTube is the most popular worldwide tool after Google. And the average time a visitor spends on YouTube is around 20 minutes daily. This I was not aware of. Even this information I found very interesting that there have been publications on female pelvic medicine assessing the quality of YouTube videos. I have never come across and never gone through such an article before, so it was something very new to me. In the material and methods section, the authors clearly mentioned the search strategies and it was more and less the way we do it for a systematic review in PubMed and other scientific databases. In this particular study, two urologists viewed and evaluated the videos and before evaluating the videos they went through the european urology association guidelines which was the latest one published in 2021 to find out which video has reliable information and which video did not in concordance with the literature duplicated non-english irrelevant and non-audio containing videos were excluded from the search. The collected data included the time since when the video was available on YouTube, the number of views, duration of videos, number of likes, dislikes and comments, and number of daily views, number of subscribers of the uploaded resource was also included. Then they calculated something called video power index which is number of likes into total number of view divided by 100. 
So the videos were finally segregated into two groups, reliable and non-reliable. Now, if you're wondering, the authors took which videos as reliable, that was based on the information the videos had regarding the treatment of painful bladder syndrome as recommended by the guidelines. Those videos were noted to be reliable. If they did not have information related to treatment as per the guidelines, they were excluded or they were put in the group as non-reliable videos. Two scientifically validated tools were used to find out the quality of those videos. First is discern, which consists of 15 questions and each of those 15 questions scored from 0 to 5. It was served to evaluate objectively the quality of health information which is present in the video. The other tool was global quality score, which was used to assess the overall quality of these videos. The other information which was noted down was the narrators of video as per whether they are real person or cartoons or patient's experience or just the voiceover. Sources of upload were also classified, whether they were from university or non-profit physicians or organization or it was uploaded from health information website or whether it was from medical advertisement or for-profit organization or were they mere patient experience. The authors have also provided the details of scoring system of both the scores they had used in the study. So the YouTube search was done on 10th August 2021, only one day. I think for a platform which is as dynamic as YouTube, you have to do this because the content is uploaded and deleted on daily basis in these kind of platforms. So their search yielded 659 videos with the keyword of primary bladder pain syndrome, 686 videos with the keyword of painful bladder syndrome and 714 video, the maximum number of videos when they search for interstitial cystitis. Understandably, it is not possible to review each and every of these thousands of videos. So what the authors did was they selected the first hundred in each of these three groups and evaluated it based on their inclusion criteria. And finally, they found 77 videos from the largest group that is interstitial cystitis, 23 in the group of primary bladder pain syndrome and 25 videos in painful bladder syndrome. The same information has been depicted in this figure. Out of all these videos, that is 77 plus 23 plus 25 videos, they found that only 62, that is around 50%, were reliable. Except for the longer length of the reliable group videos, all other parameters were more or less same. Like the view count, the views per day, likes, dislike, comments, and what they calculated as VP index all had no significant difference on comparison. Around 85% of the videos which were uploaded from the universities, non-profit physicians or professional organizations were in the reliable group. There are some important observations which I will just read out for you. The number of views, likes, dislikes and comments Showing the interaction of the video were found to be lower in the videos which were uploaded from the reliable sources like universities, not-profit physicians and professional organizations compared to other groups like patient experience and advertisement from the companies. In particular, the number of comments per meter was significantly higher in patient experience group than others. Similarly, the video power index which I have already told you was calculated by multiplying views into likes 
divided by 100 of the videos uploaded from the universities and non-profit physicians or professional organizations was lower than it was for all other sources. So after reading the results, let's see what they have to discuss. So there is something which I guess all of us understand that like many videos uploaded to YouTube, health related information videos may contain misleading information owing to the lack of expert audits. But I'm not sure that the patients or the layman who is seeking information from them understands this loophole. The authors feel that primary bladder pain syndrome is a widespread chronic disease with serious impact on the quality of life and does not currently have a sure shot treatment algorithm. For this reason, maybe many patients use the internet, especially the YouTube, to find out more about the cure for the same. Interstitial cystitis was the term which was more commonly used to search for this disease globally than the words which should be used like primary bladder pain syndrome or else painful bladder syndrome. As you and me are, even the authors feel striked that half the videos were classified as non-reliable in the study. So just realizing it is not enough, we will have to do something to standardize this. And how do we do it? Just doing study and analyzing the things won't be enough. There must be some steps which should be taken at the social media level at the end of these kind of research by the relevant branches. It may be the first step for the subgroup of the relevant associations, the authors say, to come together and form a consensus on which information can be given under headings to inform patients briefly and raise awareness about the disease. This study clearly shows that the viewers were not able to distinguish between what is reliable information and what is unreliable. So most of the people, laymen who required the information, viewed videos which were non-reliable and were exposed to inaccurate and misleading information that might be happening with all other healthcare related information available in YouTube. The videos which actually were found to be reliable and having important information were difficult to be understood by non-health personals owing to the long duration and intense medical explanation and tough terminology. On the other hand, the videos which were uploaded by patient telling their experiences and their stories received much more interaction. The authors understand the limitations of the study also, that there is no common consensus in the literature on how online videos with health information should be evaluated. And YouTube itself is a dynamic platform and new videos are constantly being uploaded. So just one day analysis might not tell the actual picture in the background. The authors conclude that in this digital world, it is clear that use of YouTube to access health information will continue to increase with time. Therefore, short and concise videos containing correct and up-to-date information featuring the latest terminology should be delivered by the relevant associations with experts. So, this was all about this paper, about today's selected paper. Tell me how you felt about it. What are your inferences and comments on this topic if you ask me one idea instantly comes to my mind like whenever you upload a video in youtube there is this option which comes first whether it is made for kids or it is not made for kids and you have to take one of those maybe this kind of option should be there whether it can be used by a layman to seek information regarding the cure of a disease or it is just for an entertainment purpose. I hope it might help. To tell you the truth, 
I really, really enjoyed reading this paper with you all. I hope you felt the same way. Thank you. Before I stop, I just want to say that I really enjoyed doing this exercise with you all. Hope you felt the same.